Hello everyone and welcome to the first video of a series in which we'll be taking a look at how to read sits and stars and also approach charts. In today's tutorial we'll start off with the basics of a sit, so if you are new here be sure to subscribe to the channel and like the video if you find this at all helpful. Now without further ado, let's get right into it. Here we have an example of a sit which I've chosen for the purpose of this tutorial. It's a chart from my home airport Zaventem in Brussels. And for those of you who do not know, SIT stands for Standard Instrument Departure, and these charts are used during takeoffs up until the first waypoint of your flight plan. So let's go over all the information that you can find on this particular chart, starting off all the way at the top. To the right here we have some information to identify the chart that you're using. First we have the airport that the chart belongs to, which in this case is Brussels Airport in Belgium. Below that you can see the type of chart, so this is an RNAV sit, which means it's a departure chart which makes use of GPS waypoints. Not all sits make use of RNAV, but this specific one does, so that's why it's written on the chart. This here is the unique designation of the chart. Sometimes not all information can fit on just one chart, so what they'll do is they'll put a reference to another one and they'll use these designations to make it easy to find them and to be able to verify that you have the right chart with you. Right in the middle of the chart we have the most important section, which is a drawing of the routing you have to follow. Pretty self-explanatory, you just follow the lines from each waypoint to another. These numbers next to the lines represent the magnetic headings, and the number in the middle there is the distance in nautical miles between the two waypoints that the line connects. Besides the obvious lateral navigation that these charts provide, they also give you information about your vertical profile, with altitude restrictions such as the one here. Most of the time there will be just one number, but this is a bit of an exception, and it has a separate value for when the atmospheric pressure is below a certain number. This thin blue line can either be above or below the given altitude, and this indicates whether you need to be lower or higher than that altitude at that specific waypoint, respectively. If the departure routing takes you over a very long distance, a certain section of the routing will often be represented like this, with dotted lines and with not to scale written next to the routing. This means that the route you see on the chart is actually longer in real life, but because it wouldn't fit on the chart if it was a one-to-one -one scale, they put a reminder on the chart to reduce the risk of confusion. In the top right corner we have some frequencies which you would use if you were flying online on VATSIM. This here is the elevation of the airport above sea level, which is used to check if you have the right altimeter setting in your aircraft, because if you have the correct one this is the altitude that will be displayed on your altitude indicator. Below that we have a box with some general information about the chart. The transition altitude is the altitude at which you switch from the local altimeter setting to the standard QNH of 2992 inches of mercury or 1013 hectopascal. Below that we can see once again that this is an RNAV chart. For this specific departure you can expect close obstacles during departure and that is also noted here with this symbol and the altitude of the obstacle written next to it. You'll often also find some instructions about when you should contact a certain controller. In this case you have to remain on the tower frequency until you are given a new frequency by the tower controller, but in Schiphol for example you have to switch as soon as you reach a certain altitude. And so on a chart of Schiphol airports that would be noted in this section as well. Finally there's also a re reminder that SITs are also noise abatement procedures, which just means that you must not divert from the routing and restrictions unless ATC tells you to. Next up we have the title of the departure chart. A SID is almost always named after an important waypoint of the departure routing, in this case the SOPOC waypoint, and because you can have multiple departures that lead to this waypoint, they also put a number and letter combination after it to make it unique. In between the brackets you have the shortened version of the name, which the FMC in your aircraft uses, and below that you have the runway the departure is meant for. Here we have a speed restriction. The 250 knots below 10,000 feet rule is a general rule that always applies, but they often still put this reminder here just so you don't forget. 
Since these charts are also meant to reduce the noise in the city surrounding the airport, there is some information about how fast you need to climb in order not to cause a disturbance. In here it says that you need a climb gradient of 7%, and in this table that is translated to a vertical speed in feet per minute, according to your ground speed. It also says that if you are unable to comply with these figures, then you should let ATC know. But this is probably not something you'll use in the sim very often, if ever at all. Most charts only give you permission to climb until a certain altitude after departure, and that altitude is given here. Of course, if ATC clears you up to a higher altitude before the final waypoint of the seat, then you can ignore this restriction because air traffic control can overrule practically everything that is on this chart. Finally, below that you have a quick summary of the routing once again. Now that we've gone over all the information and what it means, let's see what the chart is actually telling you to do. So basically it's saying that after departure you're going to fly straight ahead until you're at or above 700 feet, after which you're going to make a right turn to this waypoint and from there you're going to follow the rest of the routing, making sure you cross Bravo Romeo 414 at or above flight level 60. And that's practically everything you need to know for this specific chart. This one in particular is pretty easy to understand, but there will be charts that are a lot more complicated. But I certainly hope that this video was able to give you the necessary knowledge to be able to read and understand them. Now in the next video we will be taking a look at the so-called stars, so be sure to check that video out as well.